Hi, I'm Susan Messer, and this is my new novel, Grand River and Joy, published by University of Michigan Press. He was working with his sister at the time, so it was just the two of them, and he stopped to pick her up on the way down, which was how he described the trip. I'm heading down, he would say to her when he called before leaving the house. Are you ready? All he meant by down, or all he thought he meant, was that the route to the business took him more toward downtown than not. He drove his sil silvery blue Dodge Dart, a new model, 1966, through the streets of his neighborhood over to hers, the autumn elms and oaks and sugar maples arching over the streets, stopping in front of her house, her waiting on the porch when the weather was fine as it was that day, a perfect golden day for Halloween, something you couldn't rely on in the Midwest. They said their hellos, Harry and Ilo, not much new since yesterday. He'd come to feel that this was his life and this was how it would be from today until tomorrow and on and on. Not a bad life. With his wife, his daughters, your basic comforts, summer vacations at the Michigan lakes, the great and the small. Then he and Ilo were nearing the end of their well-worn route down, making the turn onto Grand River, crossing Joy Road. It was Detroit, and by 1966, Grand River Salt of Joy was all concrete and brick, with barely a tree or shrub, barely a patch of grass. Joy Road. Now there was a misnomer. That stretch had broken windows and traffic snarls and grown men with nothing to do during the day. Up and down these broad streets, buses belched clouds of black smoke as they roared past the metal-graded building faces and as if inviting trouble, Levine's was the only business along the stretch that lacked one of those greats. Whenever Harry talked about the place, his sister-in-laws and cousins with their stiff beauty parlor bouffants and manicures held their faces and said, Schwarze this and Schwarze that. Same for the big-bellied brothers-in-law with their ruby pinky rings and slicked back hair. On Grand River, the ungraded Levine wholesale shoes stood be beside the tiny White Castle hamburger building with its crude crenellated top. Across the street and down a few blocks was the magnificent decaying Riviera Theater, or the Iviera, as his sister called it. The R in the towering vertical marquee had become a jagged hole. Farther down, the upper bar of the E appeared gangrenous and the final R and A were also festering. In the alley behind the business, two small boys scuffed along, kicking the alley stones as they went on their way to school. Ilo checked the door locks. The boys switched to single file so, single file so Harry's car could pass. No costumes, Harry said. Halloween's for people who've got something to give away, Ilo said. She shifted her purse from lap to floor. Harry pulled into the parking space under the wooden fire escape that led to the upstairs apartment. Curtis, Harry's tenant, stood on the landing. Harry waved to him as he got out of the car. It was a warm day with a technicolor blue sky, promising a smooth road straight through to evening. A gift for the children, who could run through the leaves without blustery cold wind or driving rain, without arguments about sweaters that could bulk out costumes or stupid coats that would obstruct them entirely. Morning, Mr. Levine, Curtis said. Any work today? It was a gift, too, in a way to have Curtis upstairs, available whenever Harry needed him, but also, in a way, a burden of responsibility whenever he didn't. We'll see what we've got, Harry said. Harry tended to the keys, the unlocking, and Ilo followed him into the whole familiar cloud of smells, old and new, musty and fusty, wood and brick and rubber, leather and canvas, cardboard and jute. The two did their morning chores, turning off the burglar alarm, closing the metal bars behind them, snapping the padlock, then closing the big wooden door fastening the two deadbolts, straightening the rows of shoeboxes in the aisles of gray metal shelving that reached practically to the ceiling, and checking the thermostat near the bathroom door. Harry asked Ilo what she thought about having Sappho, his family's Doberman, for the evening so the barking wouldn't chase the trick-or-treaters away. Ilo saying, oh, all right, 
two old maids spending the night together, Harry saying thanks, coming along, coming up the hall, doing this little job and that, arriving in the front. The front of the building was composed of two rooms, in one a simple window display, three pairs of old-fashioned lace-up boots in black and brown, mini torture chambers with their needle point toes so narrow through the foot and up the ankle that they suggested severe structural damage. Harry's father, that was Joe, who had started the business, had found them in the cave-like basement of the building they'd owned on West Jefferson. He brought them along when they moved to this new address, left them behind when he moved to Florida and then died shortly after, willing the building and everything in it to Harry. Not that Harry ever wanted it. Not that Harry was any kind of expert on what he wanted. Mostly afraid to want anything. Ilo had, paced, Ilo had placed those old shoes in the window on a wooden table below the dark green arcing letters that said J. Levine Wholesale Shoes. She dusted them once a week and polished them once a year with brushes and buffing cloths and fussed with the arrangement, adding seasonal accessories as if she were a window decorator at J. L. Hudson's, Detroit's big downtown department store. Harry said nothing about her display, as he said nothing about much of what she did in their long history of brother-sister silence. But he did like having the shoes there, as they seemed to elevate their business, along with the concept of shoe, into the sweep of history, one chapter in the world's march toward human comfort, toward understanding the health function of a foot in a shoe. Because of the chores, the routine on the way up the hall to the two front rooms, Harry didn't see or notice the front window until the Halloween morning sun glinted off it, in, off it full on. And because he'd never seen anything like this before on his own front window, but because he had seen pictures, and because a deep ancestral memory of facing something like this was stored in a brain region that science had not yet identified, he now had a conjunction of shock and recognition, a sense that he'd always expected it, but that it didn't hurt any less for the expecting. And because Ilo always came up behind him as if to say, let him be the first to face whatever happened during the night, let him be the scout, and because she had stopped in the ancient bathroom where the door didn't close all the way because of the warping and the layer upon ageless layer of paint to check her lipstick lipstick of all things in a place like this, and because she was about to see the same front window he'd seen, he moved quickly in front of it and fooled with the old-fashioned shoes, thinking he might cover what he'd seen, or simply distract her so she wouldn't see, or distract himself so that he wouldn't see, wouldn't fully see. Of course, the letters were backwards when viewed from the inside, but it was surprising how many of them worked either way.